Good morning, students. So again, welcome to Airports Management. Last class, we learned about um, the evolution of airlines and airport industry. We also learned about two important case laws there, that is East Airlines and also Olympic Airlines. Uh, like there were two important case laws uh, we studied about how one could, uh, you know, really claim compensation from the airlines industry and from whom you could come, you could uh, claim compensation, whether it's airports or airlines. Obviously, it would be the airlines. And what are the circumstances under which one could claim compensation from the airlines industry. Apart from that, we learned about privatization models, one of which is BOT, B-O-T, PPP, that is public private enterprise. We learned about management contracts. We learned about sales and buyouts and so on. So today we are going to learn about organization structure of the airport industry. So without much wasting of time, let's go further as even the other students start joining in. Uh, let's wait for Abdinur as well, but yeah, let's move further because time is a factor. Let's move according to the class time. Uh, of course, the students could just catch up with the recording. Now, I'll just start with the slides. So, Abdinur, I, I'm sure you can see the screen. We'll start with, uh, I just gave a little bit of introduction of what we learned during the last class. So, directly we'll move towards uh, today's class and today's topic, that is airline company structure and the airport airline relationship. Uh, just give me a patient list, I mean, your patient hearing here, please. And, uh, yeah. So, what do you understand by airline company structure you are i understand you are part of the airline industry or you're working in one of the airports there so what do you understand by airline company structure or rather could you just tell me in you know in in your understanding and in your practical experience uh, the hierarchy model or the the organizational structure of, you could talk talk about airport or airlines, but you just could you just tell me about could you just throw light, you know, in the big right now of this class, what do you understand about you know airline company structure? All right, thank you. Uh, if I try this yes. in my opinion, it's that uh, as we know in general, every company has this own structure hierarchy in general, the whole world. Uh, but I think the airline is slightly different for the normal companies. For example, uh, in my airport, it has it used by so different types of airline companies. Okay. So, for example, uh, Ethiopian Airline for its international international airline. Uh, otherwise, it is for five star in Africa. So. In airport, it has uh, airport operator that we deal with the issues regarding the aircraft. But in the town, it has uh, a structure, for example, operators, directories, marketing, sales, uh, something that's so different. But in the airport, also, it's a small company. They have salesmen, they have an operator, they have uh, 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 operation, uh, I mean, uh, it has also uh, airport operation managers, for example, in order to deal the airport. So we could not see the directors who are in, in the market, but we deal the small uh, office that facilitate everything that you need to go to the town. So I hope uh, it has. Very good. Yes. Which department you serve exactly? Which department? You, you, you. 
कुछ डिपार्टमेंट न्यू सर फॉर एस एन एयरपोर्ट वी सो फॉर ओनली ऑपरेशंस हाँ ओके सो यू सर्व द ऑपरेशंस राइट यू ऑपरेशंस डिपार्टमेंट या Okay, so that means you. Okay, thank you so much, Abdinur. I think that was well explained in your experience, practical experience, and of course that's uh, in 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 line with that we're going to discuss. So that means at the airport level, we got the at the highest level, we got the airport director, we got the assistant director, and apart from that, we've got the operations team as well as the ONM, that is the operations and management team. Then you have got the other subordinate team levels. We got the ground staff and so on. Now at the airline industry as well, you've got the top manager. management you got the middle level management or the intermediate level and then we have got the other subsequent executive level uh, you know staff and so on so let's go to our slides and see just to save our time it's exactly what you have spoken we today we are going to talk about airline organization structure but airport organization structure already as i said earlier it's going to have the airport director the assistant airport director and then like the the operations as well as the management team and the other others say about the other team that involves a security team and so on now airline organization structure of course has a top level management medium level and the other staff let now let us see what they are exactly now the c level positions just uh, we have just enumerated here the hierarchy of the airline company c level position as we call it that is a top level management it could be again the or, uh, the owner of the airline company the owner could be either if it is privatized it could be a private uh, you know a company or it could be um, even uh, you know a government company if it is a uh, you know a government carrier then you have the the chair of the board of course it has got the board of directors which has got the chair of the board board members president vice president the ceo the cfo cfo is a chief financial officer the coo you also have the chief legal officer then you have the marketing head the other uh, like was the other departments like the marketing department the sales department and then you have the other positions like uh, you know the the positions like the flight attendants and the pilots and the co-pilots and so on then on the other hand you have the pros that is the public relation officers that the, the the other administrative uh, staff which are there and so on and then you have the aviation technics um, you know technicians aviation technicians and so on apart from that of course you have got security personnel now security personnel now if the question comes now who has appointed the security personnel it could be either the airport or it could be the airlines or probably uh, it could be under an arrangement where either the airports has arrangement with a third party organization like say for example g4 and so on or it could be the airlines which has uh, you know um, uh, you know got a contract with a third party organization or, or sometimes it just happens the airlines and the airports together they have a particular contract together which we will see what is that contract exactly in in today's class and uh, they have a particular contract and then together they decide like who should who should be appointed or to whom should contract be given for the purpose of security of course you know everything works by way of tenders and so on now the top level management talking about the organization structure or the hierarchy of course the top level management of the company commonly referred to as a c level position it comprises of the shareholders or the owners at the top level then we have the directors the board members the chief executive officer or the ceo then the other chief officers the other chief officers it could be the chief uh, coo or is the, the chief operation op officer or it could be the uh, chief clo the chief legal officer then it could be also the cfo it depends upon each airline whether at all they want these officers at the highest rank so it depends upon airline to airline uh, you know in that uh, so how they want to have their uh, structure so sometimes they, they need not be a clo that is a chief legal officer but sometimes they say no we need a chief legal officer even at the highest rank of the you know management so then you might have a clo you might have a cfo that is a chief finance officer there are other managing directors it depends even upon the designations that they give they could just give managing director finance managing director legal it, it depends but however the top level management comprises of the c level positions who are basically the decision makers and who are uh, policy formulators and who execute the policies through the intermediate positions now again 
you might have even the general manager and then again as i said earlier the the designations would differ like in, in case if you take legal so legal could be a, a clo or he could just be called as a legal head or he could be called as a general counsel or he or she could be called as a legal director or just a chief legal officer sometimes they're called as general manager legal or even senior legal manager it depends upon the practice of that company so apart from them there would be specialists then human resources head and so on so they are the ones who devise goals and uh, they are the ones who you know strategize goals that are aligned with the mission of their organization that is a top level management a top level management execute their goals and policies that are formulated through the intermediate positions or the middle level positions or mid level positions which comprise of executive positions that may be categorized as b or b plus such as managers of various departments or assistant managers again depending upon the practice and the organizational pattern which is developed by the company the company executives professional executives and so on they come under this structure now apart from that is the other staff now in your practical experience since you are already working in the airline industry so you know what who are the other staff who may be just around you they are the administrative administrative staff then you have the secretaries and you have the pro there's a public relation officer then you have seen pilots and co-pilots and aviation instructors flight dispatchers then operations staff who coordinate with the pilots and the crew and and you know um of course the meteorologists and so on so this these are the other staff then we have the ground staff the ground staff comprises of again the ticketing staff the security personnel passenger service agent airport station attendants flight attendants again then other avionics staff and technicians and the allied then some other staff could be again the baggage handlers ground technicians and so on so this is all about the hierarchy of the uh, you know airline company so this is all about it about the hierarchy of the airline company and we were talking also about airports earlier which i have not mentioned in the slides because you already got the experience but of course at the top level you have the director you have the air, the the airport director then you have the assistant director then you have the other the the other staff members depending upon the type of department it is the sales department the marketing the marketing and sales department the human resources department the legal department depending upon the structure of the organization depending upon how big is a particular airline whether it's it is just a uh, you know a, a newly launched airline or it is just a domestic airline or it is an international airline it depends upon what type of airlines it is so depend uh, okay sorry i'm talking about airport but what type of airport it is whether it's a domestic airport or it is international airport or it, depending upon that so you have upon the depending upon the size you have the structure that is there in a particular airport so again not to confuse right now i was talking about the airports just before that we were talking about airlines airports we were talking about airport director then we spoke about the assistant director then we spoke about the different departments in the airport depending upon what what is the size of the airport where is the airport situated what type of airport sometimes there are just executive level airports uh, I, i'm i'm not sure if they really aware of that there are only executive airports for example diplomatic airports I do understand where only certain charter flights come in or certain diplomatic app uh, you know app the diplomats you know who fly through this air, uh, you know from one country to another or one state to another so their uh, aircrafts or you know a uh, you know the airplanes which come in there so it depends upon what type of airport it is again so you might have diplomatic airports or you might have normal passenger domestic airports you might have international airports right so depending on that is a structure now again reiterating about the airline industry we have the top level the mid level and the other stuff and so on next let's move on to the most important part of today's class is airport and airline relationship which is again a easy topic now how is airport and airlines related now airports and airlines are two distinct entities there are two different entities airports of course the aerodromes and airlines is of course 
the ones who are dealing with the carriers, the aircrafts. So airlines and airports are two distinct entities, but however, they're enormously, in, uh, no, enormously in interdependent, one for, of course, for mutual benefit. So therefore we could refer to their relationship as a symbiotic relationship where they draw benefit from one another, or at least one party, uh, you know, gets the benefit from the other. But in case of the airline industry or even the airports, it is rather, I would say, both the parties derive benefit of each other. They're so much interdependent that you could call the relationship as symbiotic. So though these entities, again, I'm reiterating, they are two separate entities, they cannot really survive without each other because obviously without, air, without airlines, of what use is an airport? And if there is no airport, where would the airlines really, you know, land or, you know, how are they going to really operate? How are the systems going to be there? Who is going to facilitate certain services for them? Who is going to arrange certain things for them? So though they're separate entities, they cannot survive without each other. Thus, we can call it as a complex and synergistic relationship and a symbiotic relationship. The relationship between airlines and airport is, sim sim uh, I mean, a symbiotic synergistic and complex in nature. However, the interaction, the relationship between the two entities vary from one country to another. Again, why it varies? Because it depends upon the laws. It depends upon the, the, the country itself, the jurisdiction. It depends upon the type of airport that it has. For example, if you have a scene, like when you fly from one country to another, like for example, UAE has got its own airports like it has got uh you know it is well connected and it has got airports each of the emirate has its own airport and then again we have also a uh, diplomats airport apart from the normal passenger airports that we have so some of the airports are international airports of course and in fact most of the airports are international in every uh, emirates then apart from that again in india we have uh, several domestic airports that is at each state level and um, at the you know the capital of each state we have got the uh, we have international airports which are situated there now for example again in various parts of the world there is, i mean the structure it really differs like if you go to greece now greece again has its own uh, airport structure like ha how we studied during i think i gave the example of athens last time like how they their airports uh i spoke about the airports management and the uh, particular agreement that they have uh, like who is uh really managing the airport and all that stuff we learned about uh about greece and athens during the last class if you see even greece and athens again they have a different arrangement there but of course they have uh you know domestic airports like for example they have airports uh, a particular airport at COS, which is not an international airport, KOS, it's a, not an international airport, but you have an Athens, which is an international airport, which is a capital city. So it depends upon what type of uh, airport, whether it's uh, an airport which operates domestic airlines, which, which allows the landing and takeoff of domestic airlines, or it you know operates at an international level. So depending upon that, the relationship, actually, we could really study the nexus and the interaction between the airports and the airlines, because all of it actually, uh, it is, um, you know, it is governed by a particular contract, and that contract is called as the airport use agreement, or also you could call it as airport facility memorandum of understanding. So let's see how the relationship goes. So the nexus between the airlines and the airports are primarily reflected in the contract that is drawn between the two entities, such as agreement that may be called as an airport use agreement or airport facility memorandum of understanding, or by whatever title you may call it, but predominantly it, it, it enumerates the clauses that legally binds these two entities with respect to the usage of the airport airport, the two entities that is airlines and the airport. Now, the clauses that, you know, have to be there in this particular contract or that normally lucidly or clearly determine the duties, the obligations, the rights and privileges under the law of each party could be with respect to the payments that need, need to be made or received and the operation part of it, the dispute clause that is in case there are any conflicts. So how are they going to resolve the, the conflicts in case there's any disputes? So first thing normally, 
uh, what they would mention there is in case of any disputes, they, it could be solved amicably within, you know, certain, uh, you know, number of days. So they would say that we would endeavor to solve the any conflict that arises during the course of this contract period amicably within a period of say around 45 days and in case it doesn't resolve then we will take the matter up to probably the courts or we, they could take the matter for arbitration so normally in my experience that i've seen is these airports you know such kind of contracts they take up the matter before arbitration oh again it depends between you know jurisdiction to jurisdiction but it could be the matter could go either to you know the courts the normal court systems that we have the judicial mechanism that we have or it could go to arbitration so again that's what they would mention the jurisdiction clause they would mention about the governing clause that is the governing law so which law they want uh you know what law has to be applicable there then obviously it could be it depends upon the territory again territorial jurisdiction clause would be there then the maintenance clause like who would maintain it whether airlines or they would have also a separate maintenance contract so it depends upon uh, like the arrangement that they have so who is going to bear the maintenance cost whether exclusively the airport or exclusively the airlines or mostly it's the airport or you know both of them together where the airlines pay a particular amount or you know a fee to the airport so there is a particular understanding between them so there could be a maintenance clause in this use usage agreement or air, air, uh, airports use agreement or there could be a separate maintenance contract altogether of course, for a particular period of time. And adherence to the laws such as labor laws, environment laws, airport regulation, and so on, is all like, you know, to, to be stipulated there that you need to comply with such and such laws. For example, who is going to, uh, you know, appoint certain personnel, whether it's going to be the airlines or it is going to be the, uh, you know, the airports and so on. So these are the kind of clauses that are going to be enumerated in a, a airport use contract. So the airlines obviously will have to enter into, apart from the several other agreements, of course, which we all would agree upon that, saying that there are a number of agreements which are there. It's just not confined to the, the airport use agreements. Airlines will have to enter into several agreements with different airports because it, Air, airlines, as you have given me the example of Ethiopian Airlines. So Ethiopian Airlines, it does not just fly within Ethiopia, right? Or it does not just fly within Africa. So it might have different destination that it covers. So the different destination it covers, so it will have uh, uh, agreements with several airports along the routes that it operates. So in case of busy routes or where the airline has frequent flights, the contract will have to be drafted encompassing the terms of agreement between each airport and the aer aerodrome, depending upon the distinct features, such as the level of operations, whether the airport has a large scale operation or is, it is a hub operation or it is, has a small scale operation or it's just peripheral operation. And that each one depending upon what each one might have and at times the airline may not have any operation at a particular airport but it might just have a small office space next is additional agreements may also include bots that is build operate transfer this is something that we studied even during the last class under the uh, under you know, the types of privatization or the or models of privatization. So some of the agreements could be bought, BOT, that is build, operate, transfer agreement, wherein the investor agrees to build, operate, and then after successful operation and control for a specific duration, then may transfer it to the government. So it depends upon how, I mean, during a particular period of time, that particular investor who could be maybe, you know, uh, we studied about investors last class, remember? So they could be a team of professionals or they could involve even some airline professionals. It depends who is who are there as part of the investing team. So sometimes it's one of the privatization moves where they adopt this bot model where you know a particular investor builds the airport, operates, or sometimes apart from building, it could be also about restructuring an airport or then operating the airport for a particular period of time. And after uh, that particular period of time, it's transferred back to the government. I gave you an example of bot also uh, during the last class. So this is 
there may be some other agreements such as bought or even management contracts that may be entered into by the airlines. Now, airport governance and airlines, of course, airlines play a pivotal role in airport governance, especially major airlines. In the case of major decisions that involve CapEx, what is CapEx? It's capital expenditure. So the question comes in case of capital expenditure, how the airlines is included and whether at all their opinion is really sought by the airport, depending upon the agreement in line, you know, with the agreement that we are talking about. We are talking about the usage agreement. So in case of capex or capital you know expenditure major airlines certainly participate in decision making process for example if we talk about ua what are the major airlines there the major airlines there is etihad airways which is the official carrier of abu dhabi united Emir arab emirates then you have uh, emirates airlines which is the official carrier of you know dubai the emirate of dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Then you have in India, Air India, which is again the official carrier, but now Air India is privatized. It is privatized, so and so on. So now major airlines participate in the decision-making process with the airport in case there is, you know, the question of CapEx or capital expenditures. So this may be governed by a clause called as the MII clause, which means majority in interest clause. MII, that means majority in interest clause. So that may find its place in the aviation use, user agreement or the airport's usage agreement, whatever name you want to call it, or a memorandum of understanding usage, uh, airport's usage memorandum of understanding, uh, which may culminate into a contract subsequently that, uh, that of course, it could become a aviation user contract. So normally airlines base their committees at different airports. So what these airlines normally do is they have a committee. They have committees uh, and they place these committees at different airports. And it is these committee members or the committee members of that particular um, airline, who, you know, who represent the airlines and then, you know, participate in the decision-making process. For example, say there is Viz Air. Viz Air, I believe, is um, uh, uh, I'm not getting the name of that country, of course. So Viz Air. So they have again their uh, you know the operations in different parts of the world, uh, right? Uh, so I, I'm not getting the name of the place. I will tell you where it is exactly from. So Viz Air. So now Viz Air ha has its offices. So for example, it's just it would have just an office base in one city or in one place and then it would have uh, you know you know it's wide operations in some other airport so it depends so normally with air it actually has committees at different uh, you know airports and they uh, these committee members uh, they are like a mouthpiece for with air so it might comprise of not just might it has you know even its legal team there as part of their committee members and it is the committee members who are the face for the airline company and they represent them and they participate in the decision making process or even participate in any important meetings that may be scheduled by the airport authorities that necessitate the participation of airlines so there may be even conflicts that may spring up between two entities with respect to the apportionment of funds towards the building or maintenance of airport infrastructure such kind of conflicts may also come up so uh, you know airlines also participate into certain decision making process which might include the you know the allocation of funds for the betterment of the airport in case it is a major airline and in case they have such an agreement to that extent. And there are some other charges like aeronautical charges. Aeronautical charges and fees are those charges which are levied by the airport upon the airlines, which is aligned with the aviation policies, of course, and regulations and charges that are levied for landing in particular airport. And this, again, they take into consideration the weight as well as the, the number of passengers that, that really fly from that particular airline. So such fees, it actually helps in covering the operational costs and you know it helps in investing in the airport infrastructure and was and in a way actually if there is a better infrastructure of course it would help or it would serve the airlines as well as the air passengers. So aeronautical charges are charges that are levied by the airport upon the airlines. Next there are 
uh, okay, let's move on with, of course, aeronautical uh, charges. Aeronautical passenger charges are levied based on each passenger that exits the terminal. So how do they um, actually calculate this um, aeronautical charges? Aeronautical charges, it is based upon the number of passengers that exit a particular terminal uh, or the passengers of a particular airline that exit the terminal. So that is how they, you know, charge them the fees that is per departing passenger. So this may vary from country to country. For example, Paris under the Schengen scheme may have charges based on their domestic, uh, you know, whether it is domestic or Schengen European uh, Union or Schengen or non-European Union category of passengers. So depending upon what category they belong to. So accordingly, these aeronautical charges are levied upon that particular airline. Some airports may just charge a lower fee in case of transport and route passengers. For example, passengers traveling from, uh, say, example from London to Mumbai. So say they're traveling from London to Mumbai, but then they are trans, they have, they have a stop over at uh, say Dubai. So they're just transfer passengers. So they, uh, they fly from Heathrow airport in London and then they fly to Dubai. It's it, it just a stop over. And from there they are transferred to another aircraft and then they go, uh, I mean, they, uh, they move further. Uh, no, towards Mumbai. So it depends upon whether the passenger is just a transfer passenger or it is a final destination of the passenger. So again, depending upon the number of passengers each airline carries, again, aeronautical charges are charged. Next is security charges. Security charges, um, airport security services may be provided by either of, this is what we discussed earlier now, who appoints the security personnel. Now, airport security services may be provided by either of the entities person, either by the airport, uh, by the airport, or it could be provided by the airlines. So that is, in case we get disconnected, please join back. So that is either the airport or islands, or in the air, uh, or airport or the uh, airlines, or in the alternative, third party security services may be contracted, like for example, G4 and so on, which with service agencies may be government or even private agencies. So such a responsibility and cost may be shared by both entities, depending upon if at all such uh, an agreement is there. Obviously there is an agreement to that extent, but the question is whether who is going to bear the security charges cost whether entirely it is borne by the airport or, and, or it is shared with the airlines. Or the airlines is asked to you know, bear some of the cost. Next is non-aeronautical charges. Now, there is a definition given by Law Insider who has defined the non-aeronautical charges and they defined it as charges levied by an airport in consideration for the various commercial arrangements it makes about the granting of concessions, rental or leasing of premises and land and free zone operations, even though such an arrangements may apply to activists, sorry, to activities which may themselves be considered to be of an aeronautical character. Because sometimes there may be airlines which may have its own terminals. Are you understanding me? It may be an international airport, but in the international airport, they would just take, you know, a, a separate terminal for themselves because they are huge airlines. Like for example, Emirates Airlines has its own terminal in Abu Dhabi, uh, in uh, uh, Dubai Airport. Etihad has got its own terminal in you know uh, Abu Dhabi Airport. Of course, in Abu Dhabi, it's an international airport, and several airlines you know fly in and fly out. So there are several other airlines, international aircrafts that come in and go. But apart from that, there is a distinct. A, entirely separate terminal, uh, you know, for uh, um, Etihad Airlines because it is in, in Abu Dhabi because it's an official carrier. Likewise, even in India, you have um, Air India, which has got a separate terminal for itself. And apart from that, in the same airport, of course, the separate terminal. And again, on the other side, they have the all, all other international air, uh, you know, flights that come in and go, or, you know, even if the passengers want to board in the terminal, it's entirely different. So again, they have separate terminals. So that is what they're talking about, leasing part of the, the premises that, uh, you know, they are trying to rent or lease. So they are different. These are the examples of non-aeronautical charges. So it could be even, 
free zone operations depending upon whether at all that portion of uh, the premise or the land comes within free zones. So again, it's free zone operations and so on. Like for example, uh, there are different free zones uh, which are established by you know, the airport uh, industry. Like for example, they might have different free zones and in those free zones, there may be all companies which are related to you know, aviation. So likewise, so that is that comes under the ambit of non-aeronautical charges. Next is ground handling costs. So ground handling services, again, may be provided either by the airport operator or by the government uh, agency, depending upon any specific agreement to that extent. It depends again. So in the alternative, it may be handled by airline. That is in case they would opt for self-handling or by any other attached airline or by contracting the services of a specialized ground operator. Next is airport regulations. Uh, now I remember, uh, just for a moment, um, um, yes, Wizz Air is, uh, you know, actually a Hungarian uh, um, airline, Hungary, it's from Hungary. Well, so let's come back to airport regulation. So I was talking about Wizz Air. Uh, it's, um, it's, it actually is a Hungarian airline and they have, uh, you know, uh, they have operations now throughout the globe and they are still setting up their base in most parts of the world. And of course, it already has its base in, uh, you know, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and um, Wizz Air Greece and um, Italy as well. So uh, of course they are sp spreading and of course Europe with air is like quite prominent that side. Well, then we have airports regulation coming back to this airports regulation. All airports are subject to certain regulations. Like now, of course, you all know that airports are regulated. It is regulated by laws and it is regulated by certain aviation bodies which are set up by the government or it is under the law so all airports are subject to certain regulations be the federal regulations if, even if it is a federal regulation or even if it is a regulation that is promulgated by a regional regulatory authority such as it could be customs regulation it could be operational regulations it depends. Then apart from the operational aspects, even the infrastructural development projects must comply with certain regulations such as environmental regulations, etc. and so on, which may be reflected in the infrastructure contracts or project contracts. We also have this SLAs at the service level agreements and likewise. So this is all. Let me know if you have any questions. So today's class, we learned about the organizational structure. Let us quickly just go through. Today's class, we learned about the organizational structure of airlines. We concentrated on airlines. But we also touched upon the aspect of airports. So talking about airports organization structures, since like one of the students is already working for airlines. So we, uh, sorry, for airports, we spoke about the structure as having the, uh, you know, the, the director at the top level or the person, maybe the operations uh, director or the airport director rather, then you might have the assistant uh, airport director. Then uh, apart from that, you might have again, the operations director or the operations manager or the group operations director or group operations manager, depending upon the size of the airport and the type of the airport, whether it is an international airport, whether it is a domestic airport, or whether it is just an executive airport or diplomatic airport or diplomats airport. So depending upon that, you have the, the structure there. So apart from that, you might have several managers, uh, you might have uh, even a ground staff manager, you might have a security manager. Now it depends who appoints the security personnel uh, there. It, it depends upon, of course, the type of airport it is. Then, of course, you have, uh, uh, you know, the uh, you might have you might contract the services of a cleaning company, or maybe the airports, particular airport, depending upon the size of it, may have their own cleaning staff instead of contracting, you know, with a cleaning company. So again, it depends. So, so again. We spoke about airlines now. 
apart from airports, we spoke about airlines. We went into a little bit of details into the hierarchy or the organization structure of airlines. We said you have at the top level, the top management that is C-level uh you know, C-level executive or top-level management, which is a, we also call them as C-level uh, managers or C-level officers, which comprise of, of course, the board of directors. Then, of course, the board of directors headed by a chairperson. Then we spoke about uh, the other types of directors who may be a legal director, the HR director. It depends upon uh, the organization itself. Again, the airline, depending upon the size and the structure that they want to have. They might have direct, uh, you know, the positions given to them as directors. For example, in the legal field, you might call them as a legal director or you might call the person as a general counsel or you might give the designation of a CLO, chief legal officer and so on apart from that you would have the ceo chief executive officer then you have the cfo chief finance officer of course heading the finance department then you might have you know uh, the marketing head and so on apart from that you have the intermediate level the top level formulates policies and they make goals aligned with the mission of the airline company now for the purpose of execution it is done by the b plus or b level staff that may comprise of managers or even executors or professional staff then we have the other staff we spoke about the pilots the co-pilots the ground staff the technicians the technical staff and flight attendants and so on so that is about the airlines then we moved further and we studied about or we learned about uh, the relationship between airlines and airports and we said that the relationship between airlines and airports we called it symbiotic and we said that it is complex in nature but it is symbiotic and it is synergistic why because they are interdependent if there is it's it's you know if there is no airports it would be a problem for airlines and if there is no air 